purpose of this particular webinar is to give you all sort of some basic vocabulary and a very basic understanding of a number of different important topics regarding uh, sort of data science fundamentals. So a lot of this talk is a vocabulary lesson. So it's really important that we that you guys make sure you understand um, all the terms that I'm introducing and all the ways that they're used. We're going to be covering a lot of material over the next couple of hours. So it is pretty aggressively paced, uh, but we should be able to get through all of it. All right. So you see on your screen here the topics that we're going to be covering. So we're going to be talking to start about data and data types and sort of setting some groundwork uh, for all the things we'll be talking about over the course of the boot camp. Uh, then we're going to talk about data quality and data pre-processing, which are very connected uh, things. And finally, we're going to talk about uh, some similarity and dissimilarity metrics and uh, also some data exploration and visualization. So uh, we'll cover data exploration and visualization very briefly here. Uh, we're going to talk about it a lot more next week in the introduction to our webinar. So without further ado then, let's start with data and data types. So what is data is, a, is sort of a very fundamental question that we can ask. And here's where uh, our vocabulary lessons start. So data is a collection of objects that are defined by attributes. So attributes are the properties or characteristics of our objects. So every entry in our table here, and not all data can be represented nicely in a table, but a lot of it can be. So in this case, the objects, a data object is a row, and a data attribute is a column. So we think of the attributes as being properties of the objects. So the eye color of a person, the temperature, whether someone filed for a tax refund in the next year, what their taxable income was, those are all attributes of our data objects. So one of the uh, struggles people sometimes have in getting into data science is that because data science is in a lot of is, is a synthesis of you know probably three or four completely distinct fields all coming together in one way, there are a lot of different terms for the same things in a lot of cases. So this is our first encounter with that and it's going to show up again. Um, so attribute is sort of a, a decent name for these, for these ideas, but they're also called variables and fields and characteristics and features and predictors. And if you've got tabular data, they'll be called columns sometimes. So all of those different names all refer to essentially the same, to, to the same thing. They're all attributes. They're a property or characteristic of our object. Similarly, when we have our objects, so our objects are then basically a collection of attributes. It's kind of a circular definition, but it's what, it's what we've got. So each object is defined by its, by its exact attribute values. Um, and objects, we'll, we'll use the term data objects throughout this talk, um, but in general, objects have a lot of different names. You'll see them called records and points and cases samples, entities, entries, instances, uh, all of that, and, and many more sort of things. Um, you'll also see a set of data called a data set, but sometimes it'll be called a table, and sometimes you'll just hear, oh yeah, we have our data, referring to the, to the set as a whole. So, we have objects and we have attributes. So each attribute has a set of values which the objects can draw from. So each attribute, each object is defined by an attribute, by a set of attribute values. And each attribute we can think of as being defined by the set of values that it can, that it can ha hold. So we can have the same attribute mapped to different attribute values. Height can be measured in meters or feet. Temperature can be measured in Celsius, Kelvin, or Fahrenheit. Uh, lots of other sorts of things like that. Um, and different attributes will often be mapped to the same set of values. ID numbers and age are both usually given as integer values. Uh, 
temperature and height are both often given as floating point values, as decimal values. So the properties of our attributes can also be different. Um, height, for instance, has a pretty practical maximum and minimum value, as does something like age, whereas ID number has no real limit. It's whatever, we, whatever the people who created the data set define it to be. So, and that kind of gets into this to an to a, a interesting question of who defines what value set that a given attribute uses. And the answer to that is essentially we do, right? The people who create the data set do, the people who hand us the data, the data engineers or the street or the, the Twitter API that we're or other APIs that we're calling in order to get the data will have some definition of it, but we can set that ourselves too. We can change our attributes to have to be mapped to different sets of values and we'll use that in, in a variety of places all right so attributes have so we know that we have these attribute values so it's useful to talk about attributes as having being part of different class of classes different types of attributes that we're going to end up having to handle differently as we get into the actual data mining and modeling processes so there's two sort of fundamental types of attributes uh, discrete attributes and continuous attributes um, so discrete attributes have either a finite or countably infinite set of values uh, for those of you who don't know the, the term countably infinite basically means integers if you can turn your attribute into integers then it's then it's countably infinite or finite if you've got only a, a limited set of integers so good examples of these are zip codes, things like click counts, the set of, you know, a word count in a word counts in a collection of documents, right? We could in theory have as many clicks as we want, right? There's a countably infinite set, but they're always going to be integers. So we have a countably infinite set of values there. Usually we represent these as integer variables um, and Binary attributes are a pretty special case of discrete attributes that we end up having to handle differently in some cases. Binary attributes have only two values, and we might call those yes or no, dead or alive, one or zero, uh, and those kinds of columns are uh, sort of a special case. In some, in some contexts, we really like them. They make things easier. In other contexts, they can be problematic, which is pretty much everything. The other big type of attribute classification that we that we see are continuous attributes. So in this case, we have real numbers as our attribute values. There's no limitation to just integers. So temperature, height, weight, uh, oxygen level, taxable income, all these things have um, real numbers as their attribute values. They can theoretically take any value at all. Now, in practice, of course, we have to put these things into a computer and computers can only measure and represent a finite set of digits. So generally speaking, these attributes are usually represented as floating point variables. So floating points, for those of you who are uh, farther out from your learning of programming, are essentially just variables that hold a real number, that can hold a decimal. Um, floating point being the decimal, the floating point being the decimal point in the number. All right, so within these two sort of big categories of attributes, we have some subsets that are also important to think about. And one of the other, one of the most important of these is the distinction between categorical attributes and non-categorical attributes. So categorical attributes are discrete attributes that specifically have a finite set of values that they are allowed to take. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, so there's several examples here and within categorical, there are two useful subsets. So categorical values are any attribute, categorical attributes are any attribute that have only a finite set of values. If that finite set of values has a natural ordering, so this is something like rankings or grades or clothing sizes, um, we call that an ordinal attribute. So ordinal means that it has an order. Pretty pretty straightforward linguistics there. Um, 
and we use and ordinal attributes are nice because we can code them as integers and maintain the ordering between them so we can we, do, we don't have to treat them particularly specially but most categorical variables are what we call nominal categorical variables or attributes so nominal attributes have no inherent ordering to them so eye color zip codes id numbers hair color um whether someone is married or not or divorced or living with a partner there's no way you can say oh yes blue should have a value of five and green should have a value of two because i don't like green eyes right there's no there's no ordering that you can put into those variables um so nominal attributes in particular we have to handle uh, we kind of have to be careful about handling um other useful types to think about in terms of uh, things that allow us, uh, variable types that allow us to, um, to, to, do, to treat them specially in ways that are, that are useful, that are, that are easier. Um, on the continuous side are interval and ratio variables. You can certainly have intervals or ratios that are, that are discrete, but for the most part, you see them as reals or as continuous. Um, interval variables are a variable where the measurement is a measurement basically where the difference between two values is constant and meaningful so for instance uh with temperature say temperature in celsius a temperature of 100 degrees and a temperature of 90 degrees have the same difference in heat between them as a heat of 80 degrees and a heat of 90 degrees so interval variables are, are basically continuous variables that have a nice metric we can assign them that gives us uh, some nice handling. Uh, something like the decibel scale, uh, on the other hand, uh, is much harder to handle as an interval because the decibel scale, if you're thinking about the, inten the actual intensity of the sound, it's a logarithmic scale. So the difference between three decibels and four decibels is smaller than the, the difference between 13 and 14 decibels. So that's not, that's an example of, of, of a continuous variable that isn't an interval variable. All right, we can move on to data set classification. So data sets are, there are a lot of different types of data sets and they require different approaches to analysis. The pre-processing steps, the modeling steps, pretty much everything that you do with these different types of data sets is going to be different. The kinds of models you use, the kinds of visualizations you construct, the kind of cleaning that is proper for that kind of data. Um, understanding the structure of your data at the beginning is very important to not wasting time and not producing incorrect results. Uh, and it's in this step, the understanding the type, the, the, the structure of your data that things like domain knowledge tend to be very important um, but there are still certainly categories that tend to be similar no matter what domain they're in so uh, we'll talk about these three different kinds of types of data sets records graphs and ordered data sets uh, in a little bit of more detail coming up here so record data is data that consists of a collection of records, each of which consists of a fixed set of attributes. So this uh, tax ID, so this particular data set, which uh, I use in some in, in some in several places, um, is a record data. We have every data object has one tax ID, has a value of whether they asked for a refund, marital status, uh, whether they're single, married, or divorced a taxable income field and a ch and whether they cheated on their taxes or not. So that's what sort of the structure of this data set. So any data which consists of this kind of collection of records, which consists of a fixed set of attributes, you almost always represent this kind of data as a table, um, whether a database table or, or a spreadsheet or something like that. And it's the most common kind of data. Uh, so a lot of people will, if you talk about data or data sets, this is what they visualize entirely is record data. Um, so it's sort of your, your, your most common and sort of fundamental kind of data set. So within record data, there are a few useful subsets. 
So this record data with the tax data has some categorical values and then one ordinal variable. Uh, so tax ID is ordinal, right? Or is it? It's really more of a, of a nominal variable when you think about it because ordering doesn't necessarily matter, right? Sure, it takes numbers, but 10 is not meaningfully different from five. There's no ordering implied here. So tax ID is a nominal field, a nominal categorical field. Uh, tax refund is a categorical field, marital status also. Taxable income is a continuous field. So most data that you encounter has mixed data types like this. You have some categorical, some numeric, uh, and that's sort of your traditional type of record data. If, on the other hand, your record data consists entirely of numeric attributes, so this is entirely continuous, uh, entirely interval or ratio variables, then we can think of it as a mathematical matrix rather than just a table. So we would have an M by N matrix. There are M rows, one for each data object, N columns, one for each attribute, and this is nice because we can think of these data objects as points in a multidimensional space where each attribute is represented along one dimension. And that allows us to use a number of numeric techniques specifically involving distance that some algorithms not only make, the, make some algorithms easier, but which some algorithms require. There's a number of algorithms that require you to have data matrix data, all numeric data. So another useful uh, sort of subcategory of record data is document data. So in this case, it kind of is, is somewhat similar to, to, data, to a data matrix. Every term, uh, every entry, every data attribute is a, has a numeric value. But in this case, we've got counts. We've got discrete uh, values. So in this case, what we have here is each row, each data object is represented by what we think of as what we call a term vector. So this term vector in this case, and there's uh, several ways you can do it, but in this case, it just counts the number of times a given word appears in the document. So document one has team appear three times, play appear five, but coach appear none. Uh, document two, on the other hand, has coach appear seven times, but never has play appear in the over the course of the document. So, because it is because these attributes are all discrete, because they're all integer attributes, we can do different kinds of things. Different kinds of, of algorithms and processing methods are more are appropriate than uh, data matrices or mixed data is. All right, so the last special kind of record data that we're going to talk about here is transaction data. So this shares some similarities to document data, and you can uh, do use some of the same analysis, but it, it, there's different semantics around it as well. So transaction data is exactly what it sounds like. It's record data where each record involves a set of items. So... If we're at a grocery store, the set of products purchased by a customer during one shopping trip constitutes a transaction, and the individual products that are, were purchased are the items. So we can, uh, the difference between this and document data is that usually these items have more information than just a count associated with them. So not only is it bread, there's a price associated with that, there's maybe an inventory stock associated with that, how many are left, um, all of those sorts of things. So we can do sort of things similar to document analysis, but there's other sorts of information we have to consider as well. Uh, so that's transaction data. So uh, the next big category of data that we'll talk about briefly here is graph data. So Graph data, the classic example, of course, is HTML, is the, is the World Wide Web, is 
graph data is defined by as a graph. It's defined by nodes, which are uh, our vertices in our graph. So every web page is a node, and then an edge, a set of edges, which point from one node to another. And those edges can be one directional, like here, or they can be bi-directional, here. And then in addition to edges and uh, nodes, edges in some graphs have weight. So in this case, this count, for if it's an HTML website, this might be a count of the number of times that website, this website here, links to this website here. So it links five times here, but only two times here. So when we're dealing with graph data, and we won't talk about this in great detail because it's sort of its own sub problem that we don't have a lot of time to cover, but it's good to be aware of. Um, when you're dealing with graph data, you have to put a lot of thought into how you capture the relationships between the nodes, how you encode your edges and, and vertices. Um, we have to sort of, you, you don't get the same kind of neat, you know, and there are n attributes that represent that can be represented by n columns, right? Each vertice can have any number anywhere from zero to an in to, to you know an infinite theoretically number of edges coming out of it. Um, so when you're analyzing doing that sort of analysis, you have to handle it differently. The last big category of data is ordered data. Now ordered data is data which has some sort of which where each data object has to be ordered in some way so in the case of a genomic sequence for instance um, the ordering of our uh, of our ribosome of our uh, nucleic acids here gg tt cc etc is important right gg the fact that we have gg tt cc here is different than if we had had CC, TT, and then GG. Those are different, those are fundamentally different sequences. So we have to encode it in some way that preserves that ordering. Another example and sort of your classic example of ordered data is spatial and temporal data. So this uh, little GIF here represents the average monthly temperature of land, of both lands and oceans over the course of a year. So in this case, the, the spatial aspect of the data is important. Where we are in the world certainly matters when we're looking at a data object. And in this case, if we were getting this data, every row in say a database table might be might have a location associated with it and a time and there's an implicit ordering there both especially to the time but also to the location so when we're handling ordered data we have to be very careful about it um, and this is very important because time series of course uh, anytime you're thinking about doing any kind of sensing any kind of sensing material or anything like that you get time series data uh, it's the most common type of ordered data, and we'll talk during the boot camp a lot about, uh, during the back half of the boot camp especially, about how we handle time series data. Now we've got sort of that basic definition, those basic sort of, we understand what attributes are and data objects and the different types of them. We can move on to talking about data quality. Now, data quality is, particularly by new data scientists, one of the most commonly overlooked or shortened or, uh, you know, poorly shortened steps. Uh, pieces of it get ignored, get skipped because it just doesn't seem that necessary. But understanding your data quality problems and understanding where they could come from is very, very important to creating robust models that will actually work in production. You have to know what you have to know what to expect uh, in order to handle it appropriately. So there are three fundamental questions around data quality, right? We have to ask this of every data set we get. One, what problems do we have to worry about? How do we detect those problems? 
and what can we do about those problems? Those are sort of the three fundamental questions you should ask yourself every time upon approaching a new data set. And your early exploration should really be, some of your earliest exploration should really be focused at answering these questions. So I'm gonna give you some examples of how we answer each of these three questions and some of the categories of things coming up. So there are three very common kinds of data quality problems. Noise and outliers, missing values, and duplicate data. These show up in production all the time. So let's go through and sort of think about these in this context. So those of you who have a scientific or signal processing background are probably familiar with the term noise. Noise in the data science context is when we have an invalid signal of some sort that overlaps valid data. This obscures our, our actual attribute values. And fundamentally what it means is that some of our data objects have invalid values in some of the attributes. They don't have real, um, the inaccurate values there. So examples of this in real life, we have the distortion of a person's voice over the phone, snow on old television screens, particularly old CRT television screens, um, noise can appear because of human inconsistency in labeling. Uh, you see this a lot in sports, for instance, that require human judging. There's a lot of inconsistency in how people get labeled there. Um, and just in general, um, if you're trying to say rank websites, for instance, um, human inconsistency in, in labeling can be a real problem. So as sort of a practical example of what noise can do when there's a lot of it, this is a pretty straightforward signal. We've got two sine waves here with different, uh, with different uh, frequencies, but the same amplitude. There's a blue one and a green one. Um, and if we, in, in, so we can generate the sine wave, it looks very clean, very pretty. We can even sort of distinguish the two different sine waves. If we add those two waves together and then throw noise at it, just sort of basic white noise like you might see in any kind of randomization thing, and you end up with something that looks like this. So the noise has completely obscured our actual signal. Um, so noise is, again, fundamentally invalid data points that are that are obscuring our signals we have to be there's always some noise in any system it's just the nature of the universe sadly but understanding where your noise is at its worst and how you can deal with it is very important but even recognizing that it's there is the first step recognizing which of your attributes are noisy versus which are not are more noisy which are the, which, versus which of them are less noisy uh, sort of the the complementary problem, complementary problem to noise is the problem of outliers. So outliers often look like noise at first. They're data objects that have characteristics that are considerably different from most of the other objects in the data set. So if we look at sort of the, the visual here, we've got some sort of two-dimensional graphing of our data and most of our each dot each pixel point represents a data object that's been plotted on on a graph so we've got you know four clusters very ni kind of nicely defined clusters and then we've got these three other points just kind of hanging out in the middle of nowhere far away from all of the other data so the big distinction between outliers are that between outliers and noise is that outliers are actually valid values the data was collected properly, it's clean, but it's outside of the normal range. The data object for some reason doesn't look like a normal object. All right, so, so that's outliers and noise. Those are sort of the first category of data quality problems that get encountered a lot. Um, another one that shows up all the, uh, very frequently is missing values. So sometimes missing values are because 
information is not collected. So when you're looking at census information or survey information in particular, people will often decline to give their age and weight uh, or will decline to give their annual income. So you just have missing values. Other times the attributes that you're collecting may not be applicable to all cases, right? If you're asking people about the annual income of each member of their household on a survey, well, the children in the household don't have an annual income, right? It doesn't make sense. So you just code that as a missing value. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about handling missing values when we talk, when we get to data pre-processing. Um, but the fundamental ways we kind of the fundamental ways we can handle it are it throw out all the data objects that um, throw out all the data objects that have any missing values. We can estimate our missing values using means or medians or something else. We can, with some algorithms, but not all, ignore the missing values on a row by row basis, or we can just throw the attribute out entirely, which is something we might want to do if, you know, if we have an attribute that is 80% missing, we probably just want to throw that column out. Um, and one of the ways, one of the other things you can do sometimes in some algorithms is you replace missing values adaptively with, uh, this happens a lot in categorical, where you'll count the probabilities of an attribute appearing, uh, an attribute value appearing over your whole data set and then replace all the missing values with such that those probabilities don't change. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to pre-process, I guess, what to sort of get the basic sort of, this is how you handle missing values in, in a very basic sense out there. Um, and along the third category then, alongside missing values, noise and outliers, is duplicate data. So this is particularly a problem when data objects are, when we're merging data from heterogeneous sources. So if we have some data from Google Analytics coming from our website, and then we have some other data from, um, from uh, you know, actual uses, you know, click counts and, and, and sort of dwelling time and things like that, that's from another system, or maybe we have a Java applet that, you know, it, it, as much as those things still exist uh, on the internet, um, that collects some data inside of it. If we want to merge that data, we will sometimes have duplicate data objects. We'll have the same person with multiple email addresses. We'll have the same person represented with two different IDs because they're coming from two different systems. So generally speaking, duplicate data though is pretty easy to handle. Uh, assuming that you can detect it properly, which is get rid of the duplicates, <laughs> merge it together. But if you've got data that's heterogeneous, that's from heter that's from multiple sources, um, then you do have to be really careful about du about filtering out your duplicates. So now we get to the much uh, foreshadowed data pre-processing section. So data pre-processing is sometimes called data cleaning, um, but data pre-processing should, should involve more steps than just cleaning the data, just removing the problems with the data. So data cleaning is kind of a subset of pre-processing, um, but most of what we do during data pre-processing is in fact data cleaning. So you'll, again, lots of different terms to refer to basically the same thing. So there's a lot of different types of pre-processing uh, and I'm gonna talk about a lot of different strategies, aggregation, sampling, all the ones on the screen here. I'm gonna talk about all these different strategies, but um, we don't wanna use all of these different strategies on every data set, right? We want to, there's a lot of different strategies we can use, but for any given data set, we're only gonna use a couple of them usually. We don't want to overwhelm. We're not going to need every technique in our every tool in our toolbox every time. Um, another uh, note before we keep going: um, not all of these are strictly independent. 
they all get these terms categories are all things you get you see thrown around in terms you see used around the the industry um but because again data science is such a heterogeneous field um it's not not all of these things are strictly independent so um, if you see some overlap in what i'm talking about between different attributes that's why So first strategy, and this one is one we, because first, because we see it a lot, is aggregation. So we'll combine two or more attributes or objects into a single attribute or object. So this can be where we are trying to reduce the scale of our data, trying to reduce the number of attributes or objects. So we could, for instance, combine two attributes, combine a high temperature attribute and a low temperature attribute in order to get a temperature difference attribute. We've now, com co we've now combined two columns into one column. All of the, al basically every algorithm has some time dependence on the number of attributes it runs. And certainly in terms of visualization and exploration, there's only sort of so many attributes that you can hold, you can look at at the same time or hold in your head at the same time. Um, on the other hand, we might want to combine a bunch of different objects. If we have users who have many different sessions or who navigate to many different pages, we'll have dwell times that are, that are, that are different for every page and every session. And we might want to combine average all those dwell times in order to get one data object that is sort of the average user behavior for each user rather than the, you know, 10 or 15 different sessions for that user. Um, so the reason why we do this is, is exactly that. We want, if we want to average user times, for instance, we're changing our scale. We want to aggregate cities into regions, states, or countries. We want to aggregate dwell times across sessions or across pages. And one of the big advantages of aggregation, particularly averaging, is that aggregated data tends to have less variability. It's a way of reducing the effect of noise. Well, it's a way of reducing the effect of random noise. If you've got human labeling errors, then you've got human labeling errors. If you've got, uh, you know, if you've got sampling procedure errors, you have sampling procedure errors. But if you've got random errors, say you're, you know, random noise, then aggregated data will very much tend to reduce that. So as an example of that, and I really like this next page for this, these two are graphs of precipitation in Australia. So every, so these are histograms. So the uh, height of each block uh, is the number of locations where, um, where precipitation was measured, which had, in this case, a standard deviation of between zero uh, of the X value when we measured it on an on a monthly basis. So we're, we're measuring the average monthly precipitation and measuring the standard deviation of that monthly precipitation at, you know, 500 different land locations in Australia. When we do that on a monthly basis, we get this very wide spread of standard deviations. Some places are very consistent in their rainfall. Other, you know, there's kind of these two peaks and then you have this long tail of places that are just all over the place in terms of the, the variability in precipitation. On the other hand, if we take those exact same land locations and instead find the average yearly precipitation, the vari variance, the standard deviation of that, we get this very nice single peaked, mostly single peaked, very short tailed histogram we've significantly reduced our variability, we've reduced our random noise in our data set by, uh, by increasing the scale, by aggregating our data over a longer time period. So that's one of the big reasons that we use aggregation. Another very common method of uh, pre-processing is sampling. So those of you like Ron, who are from a statistics background, um, will know, will understand sampling quite well. So sampling is the main technique that we use for data selection. It's used almost always for preliminary investigation of the data, but it's often used even for the final data analysis, even in data science. 
Um, statisticians have been sampling for the duration, for the, for the length of time that their discipline has existed, because obtaining the entire set of data of interest is either too expensive, too time consuming, or even in a lot of cases, theoretically impossible. <laughs> there is no way that you can sample, that you can obtain the entire set of some kinds of data. It's just not possible. So you have to sample carefully. Data miners sample often because processing our entire set of data is too expensive or time consuming. If you talk about someone like a group, something like LinkedIn or Facebook or Google, you're talking about hundreds of terabytes into petabytes worth of data that they have stored in their servers it's in it just would take it, it you cannot process that kind of data on anything remotely resembling a human lifespan even with modern technology we can process a lot of data but there's still a fundamental limit of what we can process and on top of that there's a fundamental limit of what we as humans can look at what we can really get a, what we can look at all at the same time so when you're sampling, there is one thing more than anything else that you have to keep in mind, which is representation. So the key principle when you're sampling is that the sample will work almost as well as using the entire data set if and only if the sample is representative. So and representative is sort of one of those fun words that means something different for every data set, right? So sometimes representative is as easy as unweighted random sampling. Other times, and this is particularly true if we're doing something like anomaly detection, we need to make sure that whatever sample we take has an appropriate proportion of anomalies versus normal data. In other contexts, it gets even more complicated. Sometimes we want to make sure we balance out our different classes in a classification context, or that certain kinds of attribute values that aren't even that aren't even target values but attribute values um, are all represented in a certain way. And Balachander notes that sampling will typically exclude outliers and may have noise, and that's absolutely true. Sampling, if done improperly, can absolutely add noise to your data. Um, or, well, not really add noise in, in our context, but certainly, um, but certainly can uh, introduce noise. And outliers are probably not going to appear because you don't sample enough to make them appear. And that's true. Um, and that's actually one of the advantages of them, of sampling, is that it will exclude outliers most of the time. So if we aren't in an anomaly detection context and we don't care, and we kind of don't want outliers muddying the waters, so to speak, um, we'll want to exclude them and sampling can help us do that. There are several different types of sampling um, that are important uh, that, that sort of will come up as, as we talk about the, over the course of the boot camp. So there's simple random sampling where there's an equal probability of selecting any particular item. Um, there's stratified sampling where we split the data into several partitions and draw out random samples from each partition. Um, if we're doing stratified sampling with equal sized partitions, then that's equivalent to, ran to simple random sampling. But in a lot of cases, we don't do it with equal sized partitions. We do it with smaller or larger. We have different sized partitions to draw from, which is what makes it fundamentally different from simple random sampling. Or we are drawing different numbers of points out of out of the different partitions um, so those are sort of two different sort of our two fundamental ways of, of actually uh, of, of grouping the data um, and then when we're actually sampling there's two kinds of sampling that come up the sampling without replacement which is what most people think of when uh, they're thinking of sampling uh, so sampling without replacement is if we have a bag and it's got five red balls and four blue balls and three green balls in it. And we reach into the bag and pull a ball, a ball out. And we say, aha, I drew a red ball. 
then we take that red ball and we put it on the table. And then if we want another item, we reach back in and pull out a different ball. So now the second time we draw, instead of there being five reds and four blues and three greens, there's four reds, four blues, and three greens. So in, so that's the sampling without replacement. We do not replace what we're sampling back into the bag. On the other hand, there are uses, and this actually one of the most important, um, a, a fundamental concept, uh, a, a, a very common type of, an, of modeling uses sampling with replacement as part of it. So in sampling with replacement, instead of taking the red ball out and then putting it on the table and drawing again, we reach into the bag, draw, pull out a ball, say, aha, it's red, note down on a piece of paper, say that it's red, then put the red ball back in, shake it up and draw another ball out again, record its color, put it back in the bag. So without replacement with replacement, that's exactly what it sounds like, but they end up having very different uh, mathematical results. And as a result, and because of that, they are used in, di in different contexts. All right, so the last thing we need to think of, another, another aspect we need to think about around sampling is what size of sample we want to do. And I really like this picture because I think that it very excellently illustrates the problems with sample sizes. So when we sample, we do lose information, just like with aggregation. So you have to be um, careful not to make your sample too small. So if we look over here, we have this data set uh, and it's just, you know, position data. This is, I think, some sort of lithography picture. Um, so we've got these black structures and then we've got this sine wave in the background and then a little bit of just sort of random noise scattered all over the place. So if we subsample this by a quarter, so we sample 2000 points, we can still see the structures, the big thick structures are still represented, but the sine wave has almost entirely disappeared. We've lost that background image. And if we go down even farther, if we sub subsample by another quarter down to 500 points, we've lost even the information of, of these things. Like you can look at this and you can kind of see the structures, but only because you know what the structures need to look like. If I showed you just this graph first, you wouldn't pick out the structures. You wouldn't be able to, there's just not enough information there. So we wanna reduce our sample size. We wanna sample a small enough size that we can process it efficiently, that we can analyze it efficiently, that we can explore it efficiently. But we have to be really careful not to take too small a sample. Um, and unfortunately, there really isn't a good rule of thumb on this necessarily, um, but you just need to, you need to play with it. You need to, you know, take lots of different samples of different sizes. You need to do this to figure out when your information starts to disappear. The next kind of thing we're going to talk about is what's called the curse of dimensionality. So this is as much a data, this is sort of a data quality issue, but it's something that we have to be careful about when we're doing data pre-processing. So the curse of dimensionality is that as your number of dimensions increases, so as the number of columns, number of attributes you have in your data set increases, the data inherently becomes increasingly sparse in that space. Since in a lot of contexts, in a lot for a lot of different algorithms, definitions of density and distances between points of similarity and dissimilarity um, are really important to things like clustering methods and outlier detection, so anomaly detection. And this all becomes less meaningful. If you add enough dimensions, every point looks like an outlier. So a great illustration of this is that if we randomly generate 500 points in, a, in, a, uh, in an n dimensional space, and we compute the difference between the maximum distance between any pair of points and the minimum distance between any pair of points, and this has been normalized in a log taken to make it look pretty, we can see that in, at two dimensions, 
with 500 randomly generated points, the maximum distance is about three and a quarter times larger than the minimum distance. Actually, this is 10 to the three and a quarter times larger because there's a log, there's a log base 10 here. As we increase the number of dimensions though, that spacing falls off really sharply. And by the time we get down here, 30, 40, 50 dimensions, our points are so sparse that the minimum distance between points and the maximum distance is almost the same thing. This is a this this represents this 50 point represents a factor of something like 10 to the 20 10 to the 0.25. Like the fourth root of 10 is the difference between the maximum distance and the minimum distance. It's just a very small number. It's really hard to define outliers when you have such high dimensional data because every point is an outlier on in, in, in some ways because there's just so many there's, there's just so the, the space is so sparse. So the solution to this data quality problem is something called dimensionality reduction. So we can do dimensionality reduction via aggregation um, or other sorts of, of column combination. Um, but there are also a number of uh, mathematical techniques. Two of the big popular ones are principal component analysis or PCA and singular value dis decomposition, also called SVD. Um, and those are mathematical techniques that will run automatically that will reduce the dimension dimensionality of your data. PCA actually usually goes from N dimensions, so as many dimensions as you happen to have, all the way down to two dimensions. Uh, Natalie, they are kind of the same thing, but they aren't exactly the same thing. I'm not going to go into great detail because we don't spend a lot of time on dimensionality reduction over the course of the boot camp, um, but my understanding is that they are distinct um, techniques, though they have the same goal. They just are different. They, they have the same goal, but they are achieved via different mathematical methods. All right, so another way to reduce uh, dimensionality, uh, to reduce dimensionality of data other than just um, PCA is a lot of times we have redundant or irrelevant features. So this is going back to Teresa's questions about dimensions being independent. So a lot of times we have, uh, so if we have redundant features or irrelevant features, that will increase our dimensionality artificially. It won't, it'll be, it has, it contains little to no information, but it increases our dimensionality. So we want to be very careful about trying to detect these things. So a redundant feature example, for instance, is that the purchase price of a product and the amount of sales tax paid on that product. Those things are, you know, based on the state, completely connected. You can calculate one from the other. They're perfectly correlated. So as a result, you want to get rid of it because it increases your dimensionality without adding new information. Uh, same thing with irrelevant features. Uh, a student's ID number, the vast majority of the time, is irrelevant to the task of predicting student's GPA. And it isn't just, these types of redundant and irrelevant features don't just harm us via increased dimensionality. Redundant features effectively weight features multiple times. If we have the same information contained in two columns, two separate columns that the model thinks are, in, that model thinks are both important, we've double weighted that information. Similarly, irrelevant features can confuse our model. It'll, the model will try to do some fitting based on those features and it'll just sort of diffuse the effectiveness of the model. So we need to be, so one of the, one of our big steps of, of data pre-processing is making sure we figure out what attributes are redundant and irrelevant and aggressively cutting them out of our data set. And there's a number of different, um, a number of different uh, techniques you can use to do this kind of subset selection. You can brute force it, just try all your different preacher subsets. Um, some algorithms, uh, some of the most popular algorithms used actually, um, naturally do feature selection. And so that's, that's always good. Um, sometimes you have a filter approach where you use your exploration and what you know 
about the data set in order to filter out the bad features. Um, and sometimes uh, you can get the, uh, the, the data science inception going on where you use a data mining algorithm uh, on your data mining algorithm in order to find the best subset of attributes. Uh, but that's feature subset selection. It doesn't share a lot. Um, I'm going to move on a little quickly. Please ask questions as they as they arise to you, but we're uh, running a little bit behind, which is great. I love the discussions we've had, and it's important. The front half of this presentation is more critical than the back half, um, but I am going to start increasing the pace a little bit just as a heads up. So please ask your questions as they come up. So another uh, common technique, uh, and this kind of goes with aggregation to a, to, to a certain extent, um, is feature creation. So sometimes we don't, we have the cursor dimensionality on the one hand, but other times we don't have enough features. We don't have enough information. There's more information that, I, that we could have. So we can either extract things, say combine two columns that in order to get new information. So uh, for instance, in sales, we could determine the tag price from the total amount paid, kind of fil filtering out the, um, the, the, the sales tax, which might be important. Um, other times we have aggregation and things like that with feature construction. Um, and last and really mostly least, because we don't do this that much, um, is mapping data to a new space. So those of you from a, uh, from a scientific background are probably familiar with the Fourier transform, <laughs> um, which uh, takes data that is in the time domain and converts it to be in the frequency domain, um, which allows you to pick out different pieces of information. Um, we don't do this kind of transformation that much in data science um, because it tends to require transforming the entire data object. Um, but it is something to be aware of to have in your back in the back of your head because there are some times uh, that you really do want to do some sort of massive transformation like this, particularly in an, in an anomaly detection time series context. You're going to want to, you might want to do things like take a Fourier transform of your data. Um, and in addition to doing something uh, very complicated like a Fourier transform, you can take a lot more similar, uh, a lot more straightforward transformations of your data. So very common transformations are taking the exponential of a data, taking the logarithmic, the logarithm of a data value, um, taking the absolute value of a data value. Um, all of these allow us uh, to, all of these uh, types of things allow us to very nicely um, to try to bring out different dependencies in our data, to try to correlate our data our data attributes better with whatever our target is. Uh, the two, the other two things here, I'm going to take special time to talk about because they show up a lot. So standardization and normalization are probably the most common kinds of transformations that are applied to, to data, to attributes um, in data science. Standardization is where we take our numeric data and we divide the numeric data, each numeric uh, value by the mean, or we subtract, sorry, we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation of our data set. So what this does is it forces our data to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So that's why it's standardization. Um, what this, the reason why we do this is that a lot of times is that it's a way of scaling our data down. If you have, for instance, age and uh, annual income, there are a lot of different, really the majority of uh, model of algorithms won't, will overweight your data science or will, will overweight your uh, annual incomes. So if you have age and annual income. So, but if we standardize both of those, 
then age and annual income are going to be weighted in exactly the same way. Um, a somewhat less extreme version of, of to do the same thing is normalization, where we simply subtract the minimum from, in a, from every data value and then divide by the maximum. And that maps the entire data onto the range from zero to one. Um, it distorts the uh, separation between the values to a certain extent, um, but it, it does scale it very nicely so that age, again, taking the age versus annual income distinction, age and annual income will end up on the same, on the same zero to one scale. They'll be weighted the same way by our, by our algorithms. So the next uh, section is similarity and dissimilarity. I'm gonna kind of blast through similarity and dissimilarity uh, to get to data exploration and visualization. Um, if we have to cut data exploration and visualization a little short, we will because we're gonna talk about it a lot on, uh, I think it's Tuesday when we do um, when we do the on Monday when we do the introduction to our uh, when we do the introduction to our lab webinar so similarity and dissimilarity are exactly what they sound like similarity is a numerical measure of how alike two data objects are uh, it is higher when more when objects are more alike and you usually set it up so that it falls in the range between zero and one. Dissimilarity is a numerical measure of how different two data objects are. It's lower when objects are more alike. The minimum dissimilarity is zero almost always. Uh, the upper limit varies based on the exact metric you're using, but is often one, uh, just sometimes higher. Um, and we'll use the term proximity to refer to either how similar or how dissimilar objects are. So, so objects that are close will have a high similarity or a low dissimilarity. And if objects are far, if they have a low similarity and a high dissimilarity. Now, in the context of data matrices of very nice numeric data, we can use something very straightforward. We can use simple di distance formulas. But in the context of ordinal of categorical data, numer numer uh, uh, nominal or ordinal data, then we often need to use different things. So nominal data, we usually use this sort of binary similarity dissimilarity measurement where uh, dissimilarity for nominal is, dissimilarity is zero if the two values are the same and one if the two values are different and exactly the reverse for similarity. Uh, ordinal for ordinal values uh, will often for dissimilarity will often map our values to our integers from zero to n minus one and then take the difference in those integer values and divide by the maximum giving us a nice uh, a nice measurement between zero and one and similarity we take one minus the dissimilarity measurement so that's really the reason why I'm talking about similarity and dissimilarity separately rather than just sort of talking about one of them is that there are some data types like say nominal data types where similarity is a very natural measurement it's one if the two are not are, are the same and zero if the if the values are not the same uh, whereas for something like ordinal variables the measure of dissimilarity is kind of an easier and more natural way to think about it we think about how far apart the variables are not how close together they are um, and similar for interval or ratio variables, we'll often just take the absolute difference between the variables uh, as a measure of dissimilarity. Um, and then we might do some slightly more complicated things to calculate a similarity. So when we've got real values, uh, and this is sort of a, a primer for, for a later, for, for the boot camp, for a reminder for those of you who've been out of math classes for, for a while. Um, when we've got purely, when we've got continuous data, purely continuous data, uh, we will often use Euclidean distance as the distance, as a way of measuring similarity, uh, actually really as a way of measuring dissimilarity because it's higher 
if the val if the uh, the more unlike the objects are. So uh, this formula might be a little intimidating to some people, um, but I promise you that you are familiar with Euclidean distance. You just maybe don't know the term. Uh, it, Euclidean distance is what you would what you'd hear call a distance formula, just the distance formula in your sort of high school algebra classes. Um, and most people have seen it in two dimensions and sometimes three. Uh, but one of the very nice things about the Euclidean distance is that it is that it generalizes very naturally to as many dimensions as you want. So in order to calculate the Euclidean distance between two between two data objects, we take the difference in each attribute value, square it, and then sum that and take the square root. So for instance, we have four points here with at 0, 2, 2, 0, 3, 1, and 5, 1 that are all at different plotted at different points. And we can construct a distance matrix describing how dissimilar all of our points are. So point one and point four are the most dissimilar. They're the farthest apart. Whereas uh, point two and point three are the most similar. They're the closest together. They are, point three is also fairly similar to point four, whereas point two is somewhat less similar from point four. So another uh, distance metric that we see particularly in the context of documents is called cosine similarity. So we have documents, we have turned them into term vectors. Uh, we can find how similar the, and this is a cosine similarity is a measure of similarity, not of dissimilarity. Uh, we can find how similar the, uh, the, the two documents are by thinking of each of them as vectors, taking their dot product, which for those of you who uh, never had it or don't remember your uh, college vector calculus classes, <laughs> um, you take each attribute, attribute by attribute, and you multiply them together across your two different objects. So three times one, two times zero, zero times zero, maybe this is play, and this is coach, and this is tournament. And so we'll do our counts, and then we'll multiply them all together, document to document, and sum that all up. And then we end up dividing by the magnitude, by the product of the magnitudes. So the product of the magnitudes is just you square each attribute, add them all up, and take the square root. So in this case, we have a, a dot product of five. We have a D1 and a D2 of 6.481 and 2.245. Those are our magnitudes. So we multiply these two together and divide five by that. And we end up with a cosine similarity of 0.315. Um, cosine similarity is a really nice metric for documents because it gives us this very clean zero to one measurement that really does uh, that that suffers less from the curse of dimensionality than something like Euclidean distance does. So uh, because document vectors tend to get very, very long because there's a lot of different words in the in the in each in a, in a given language and given and documents might have lots of different words in them. Um, cosine similarity is a way to avoid some of the curse of dimensionality. Um, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about um, uh, encoding um, when we talk about uh, uh, encoding documents more more directly in the boot camp. The last uh, another very common one that I'm sure Ron in particular is very familiar with as a st as a statistician is uh, correlation. So correlation measures essentially the linear relationship between the objects. It tells us if as uh, attribute uh, or as object uh, as object P uh, if object P and Q move together is kind of the way to think about it. So what we do is this is we standardize each of the objects attributes and then we take their dot product and it gives us a value between one and negative one. 
So it's not exactly uh, uh, um, so it's not exactly a, a standard similarity measurement um, that describes. Uh, though we can square it, and then it becomes between zero and one, and becomes a standard similarity measurement. That's sometimes called the coefficient of determination. Uh, sorry, R is the coefficient of determination. R squared is the correlation. I don't remember my statistics classes well enough. I apologize. Uh, the the two tend to get used in data science very interchangeably. <laughs> um, so here, for those of you who who haven't had some that much statistics or or who don't remember, is uh, a visual example of our, of our correlations. So when correlation is negative one, which is the highest possible value, or the lowest possible value, we have a very linear relationship. As one object goes up, the other comes down, whatever up and down happen to mean in this context. Um, and uh, where the correlation of one, we have the objects are going up together or coming down together. Um, and as we get to small to correlations that are closer to zero, we can see that this data has very little clearly has very little relationship. Whereas we get closer to one and negative one, we see a sharper and sharper linear relationship between the two. Um, correlation is often used uh, as a metric for uh, is one of the metrics that we use to. Uh, to evaluate regression models. So we'll talk about it more in that context. I just wanted to make sure we introduced it so people had heard the word. Uh, if you haven't had a, a, a if you haven't had much of a, a statistics background or it's been a while. All right, so last but very certainly not least uh, is data exploration and visualization. Data exploration and visualization are critically important to the practice of data science. In fact, we're going to spend the vast majority of the first day of the boot camp talking almost exclusively about data exploration and visualization because it's just that important. Um, you need to understand what your data looks like before you can start to model it properly. So what is data exploration? Essentially, data exploration is visualization and calculation that allows us to better understand the characteristics of a data set. The key motivations of it are that we wanna be sure we select the right tool for right tools for pre-processing and analysis. And because it uses our human mind's really, really powerful ability to recognize patterns. A person will recognize a pattern that is that a data analysis tool won't in a lot of contexts. Building a neural network which will tell you if a picture is of a face is a massive endeavor. It's a very complicated endeavor. But humans can do it. Most humans can do it innately, automatically, very, very quickly. So uh, this is, of course, related to the, the historical uh, phrase of exploratory data field, rather, of exploratory data analysis, EDA. Um, the sort of original book is, is uh, Exploratory Data Analysis by John Tukey. Uh, and if you're interested in data exploration specifically, um, there's some uh, information here. And, and uh, this will, of course, be online shortly, so you can pull that off more quickly. Um, but it's not the, the original focus of the, of the field of EDA is not the same as our focus as data scientists, as data scientists, what, uh, our focus is on summary statistics and visualization, um, in EDA clustering and anomaly detection as I think Ron, you have some background in this field, I suspect, because you were talking about, and Natalie as well you know, using clustering is exploratory techniques. Anomaly detection is exploratory techniques. In this, in, in our context now, clustering and anomaly detection are major areas of data science interest, major, major fields, subfields of their own, not just a piece of an exploratory. Though clustering for exploratory purposes is still used a great deal. It's 
one of our, it's actually good clustering algorithms and good clustering practice is one of your more powerful tools if you have a very complicated data set. So I'm gonna go through and, and talk a bit about the kinds of summary statistics we like to use now. Frequency, mean, standard deviation, or counts mean and standard deviation. So summary statistics are numbers that summarize properties of the data, exactly what they sound like. Most can be calculated pretty quickly in a single pass through the data, in one, in one pass, which is very nice. Most of them can be calculated uh, in just about any language you care to do them in. Uh, you know, whether you're doing it in SQL or R or Python or you know, anything else that you care to do it, summary statistics are pretty easy to calculate. So two of, for categorical data, uh, our most common summary statistics are frequency and mode. So the frequency of an attribute is the percentage measuring how often the value occurs in the data set. So for example, the if the attribute is gender, then the value female will occur a bit less than 50% of the time. The value male will occur a bit less than 50% of the time and something else will occur some small percentage of the time. So we can think of those numbers as being percent as, as being percentages. On the other hand, the mode of an attribute is the most frequent attribute value. So in this case, we might say, aha, you know, our, in, the, in the, this case, we might have um, something like uh, marital status, single, married, divorced. Depending on our data set, we may want to know what the most common value is. Are, do, are we have, do we have mostly single people, mostly married people, or mostly divorced people in our data set? That will change the way we look at the data. Um, frequency and mode are typically used with categorical data, though if you have, um, sometimes when you have continuous data, it's useful too. Though more often, when we've got continuous attributes, the uh, sort of, we, we care, we think more about in terms of percentages, or sorry, percentiles. So this is more useful than, than direct frequency or the concept of mode for the most part. So percentiles are pretty simply defined. Um, I have a formal definition here, but the easier way to understand it is by looking at it there. So percentile is you count the number of people who have a smaller value than you and you count the percentage of the total group that is that that is that number, and you are that, thus at that percentile. So if you are the fourth tallest person in a group of 20th, that means 80% of people are shorter than you, and it means that you are at the 80th percentile. And so if the height is 1.85 meters, then 1.85 meters is the 80th percentile height in, the group that, in this group that we care about. Uh, other measures we care about, measures of center. Uh, median versus mean is, a, is an age-old debate on the internet going all the way back about whether the median or the mean is the better way to measure the center of a data. And the, as is often the case with age-old debates on the internet, the answer is both. Um, we have means are easy to calculate and but very sensitive to outliers. Means also give you a, can give you a real sense of the skew. If you have a skewed data, means can give you a sense of the skew of your data very nicely. So on the other hand, the median is the number such that, uh, is the number such that 50% of values are below it and 50% of values are above it. The median is the 50th percentile value. Um, there's also something called a trimmed mean, uh, which I won't talk about a great deal. Uh, so medians tell you exactly where your center is. So if you really want to know what the, what the exact middle of your data is, such that 50% of people are below it and 50% are above it, median's great. It's, it's basically immune to outliers. It's very good that way. But it's harder to calculate in some ways. Um, and it doesn't tell you anything about the skew of your data. If you do have a really long tail, the mean will let you know about that. And particularly, it's the difference between the median and the mean 
that is often what we care about because that's what tells us about how our data is skewed. We want both numbers. One is not necessarily better than the other. The last summary statistics that we tend to care about are measures of spread, range, and variance. So variance or standard deviation um, are the most common measure of a spread of a set of points. Uh, it tells us about how different the points are very nicely, kind of tells us exact variance and standard deviation are effectively measures of the spread of our data very directly. Range is the difference between maximum and minimum, which is definitely something we might care about. Um, but range, variance, standard deviation are all very sensitive to outliers. So there are other measures that we use. So we use interquartile range, which is the difference between the 75th percentile value and the 25th percentile value in a set of data. And we'll sometimes use the median absolute diff uh, deviation, uh, which is essentially the median of the variances. <laughs> um, and then, and sometimes we'll use the average absolute deviation too, which is the mean of the variances. So all of these show up as we're trying to calculate summary statistics. So I'm going to take a quick shot through a couple of different visualization techniques right now, uh, different types of graphs. We're going to go in much greater detail into this during the boot camp. Uh, pretty much all, almost all of the first day of the boot camp is um, different visualizations, how we use them, why we use them, all of that sort of thing. One of the most common type, most common and popular types of visualization is a histogram. So histograms show the distribution of values of a single variable. We design, divide the values into bins and then count the number of objects in each bin. And the height of a bar on our graph indicates the number of objects in a given bin. So one of the important pieces of a histogram is that the shape of the histogram is going to depend on the number of bins you use. You usually have to experiment with different numbers of bins to extract the most interesting information. So here we see two graphs of petal width of the petal width of, of some set of data set of flowers. Um, it's actually from that iris data set we were looking, we were touching on briefly earlier um, with different bin widths. So we can see what they, uh, so we can see here more clearly in the second than in the first that we have two very clear spikes maybe a third little spike here, and then a sort of a long, messy tail over in this side. You can also construct two-dimensional histograms that shows the joint distribution of two different attributes. So here we're plotting, we're counting the number of objects in petal width, the number of objects in each petal length uh, bin, and then adding up the numbers in each bins uh, to get the height of our count. Um, Two-dimensional histograms are really nice for exploring uh, correlations between different attributes. Another very common visualization technique is the box plot. The box plot displays the distribution of data. Um, we've got a little box here where the edges of the box are the 75th and 25th percentiles. The median or the 50th percentile is shown as a middle bar. Then we show the 10th and 90th percentiles up above. And if there are any outliers, which outliers are a certain distance past the uh, 90th and 10th percentiles, we'll mark them explicitly. So for instance, here's an example of that iris data again, sepal length and sepal width, petal length and petal width. Uh, shown in various box plots. So we've got centimeters on the left side, the values on the left side, and then each attribute has its own distribution. And we can see that the sepals are pretty well, but you know, clustered together. Petal length is all over the place and petal width is a little less all over the place. So box plots are very easy, are very good for visualizing that kind of distribution. Another kind of plot that we use a lot are scatter plots. So we allow our attribute values to determine the position. We pick two attribute values and we plot the two attribute values against each other for every data object. 
We can also use size, shape, and color of our markers to display supplementary attributes. This allows us to construct three or four dimensional graphs on a two dimensional plane very easily. Um, and in particular, we will see arrays of scatter plots used uh, quite often as a way to compactly summarize our factor relationships. So here's an example of that same iris data set and a scatter plot of the attributes. So we've got every attribute plotted against the others. So we've got sepal width and sepal length, and then sepal width and petal length, and then sepal width and petal width here. And the color and shape of our markers tells us what, kind, what the species of the plant is. So we can see, for instance, that sepal length and petal width, petal width in particular, if we look at the petal width uh, row and column, seems to be a very good predictor for at least the Setosa, um, the Setosa species. Uh, another plot that we use a lot are contour plots, which we've seen before. Uh, essentially, you can think of geographical maps here. We use contour plots for, geo, for, geo, to, for topographical maps all the time. So in this case, we partition the plane into regions of similar values and color in those values, separating them with little contour lines to show the differences. All right, so that was a very, very fast, very, very fast blast through the various, t through a number of different kinds of graphs. And that concludes our webinar on the fundamentals of data mining. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. Please check out the next video in our introductory series, Introduction to R. Have a nice day. Give it a like if you found this useful and subscribe to our channel for more crash courses and tutorials. Thanks for watching Data Science Dojo, data science for everyone.